And let me welcome a doctor that's on the front line. He even is Tech Tuesday has a company that does tel telemedicine. He comes directly to you through tech. And he's been on the front lines with Trump from day one, been targeted. And I've uh, been fighting that fight as well. Let me welcome back to the show, Dr. Eugene Gu. Welcome. Thank you so much, Karen, for having me on. And wow, it's amazing you had Joe Biden on, future president. <laughs> So that's yeah, great. That, that was that was that was him on Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, oh, excuse me. I shouldn't call it that. It's The View. Uh, that was him ah, on The View I earlier. I wish uh, he has been invited. <laughs> uh, he has yet to come right. yet. Um, let, me, come. let me just let me just uh, before we talk about cool quit and everything that's going on with coronavirus, because I have a billion questions. And of course, Drew McCaskill is here as well. Um, just remind people because you you became uh, a national figure around a battle you were having uh, that cost you your job temporarily. Can you just remind people about what that was and how we got here? Yeah, definitely. So um, I was one of the seven plaintiffs who sued President Donald Trump for blocking us on Twitter. Uh, we filed a lawsuit with the Knight First Amendment Institute um, in New York court um, and what happened is we won twice. We first won at the federal district court uh, level, uh, and then we won at the Second uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. And in fact, yesterday we were just handed another victory in that the uh, you know the Trump administration wanted to appeal the Second Circuit ruling, and instead of uh, hearing the case again in front of the whole judge panel, they said you know this is a clear cut case and you know, they're not going to hear it again. So the only recourse left uh, may be going to the Supreme Court. Uh, oh, and so is. we're just waiting to hear what the federal government and the Trump administration and the Department of Justice will do with that case. Uh, but, you know, all things in summary, we were able to still preserve that public forum underneath Trump's tweets to, you know, voice our concerns uh, about what's going on in this country. He can't block American citizens. Um, and so not just me, but many other activists and influencers and people who care about our country are able to speak their mind without getting blocked by the president. Why was he blocking you, Dr. Gu? So he blocked me because I made um, a critique about his poll numbers. Uh, but he blocked he, before this court case, he was blocking a lot of people for a variety of reasons, all of which were just political dissent. You know, like he doesn't he's a very thin skinned president and he doesn't want any kind of negative comment directed at him, even if it's not derogatory, even if it's just legitimate, you know, political dissent from an American citizen who cares about the country. Now, we expect um, and I think maybe it's wrong that doctors should be agnostic and they should be neutral and they shouldn't have political views. So your, you know, resistance to Trump's presidency cost you uh, some positions, right? Right. So Vanderbilt University Medical Center was extremely, you know, they had Melania Trump visit the hospital multiple times. Trump visited. So they they really want to be in good graces with the Trump administration. And so it was, you know, bad PR for them, for me as an Asian American physician to first, you know, protest against the Trump administration, protest against the racism that I experienced within Nashville, Tennessee and the Vanderbilt hospital system. Um, and it cost me my job there, which is, you know, as many physicians know, residency is a very vulnerable time for physicians. Uh, it's a time where we're training, uh, especially surgical residency. Um, and we're at the mercy of our attending physicians and supervisors. And so if one person doesn't like what you do, doesn't like the activism, uh, speaking out against racism uh, or, and white supremacy because it makes them uncomfortable, then they can totally destroy your career. This is not just it didn't just happen to me. It have, I've, I've spoken to many other residents uh, who have also lost their jobs or got reprimanded simply for speaking out against discrimination. So I think that there's this whole patriarchy within medicine um, that people don't really know about, but is it's very harrowing as well. Now, I'm going to get into the, to, to the facts and the data, but I, I just want to lay the foundation because <clears throat> this is not just about a, a bungling mishandling of a pandemic. This is about, in my opinion, a very willful, strategic way in which he's laying out information. I think he has a grander purpose right down to calling this the China virus. 
um, as an Asian American, when you hear that, and, and I get so many people who call and, and reach out to me via chat or Twitter, and they say there's no problem. You know, we heard the lady say, well, we don't have a problem calling it Chinese food. Why can't, you know, it came from China. Why can't we call it that? As an Asian American, do you, do you hear the dog whistle? I definitely hear the dog whistle, and thank you so much for bringing up this issue. Um, you know, the first time that Trump tweeted about the coronavirus or COVID-19 being the Chinese virus, I was extremely shocked and horrified as an Asian American. And when you mentioned that there was an OANN reporter at a White House press briefing, an Asian American reporter, who said, oh, it's no big deal. It's just like saying Chinese food. Chinese, saying Chinese food is not racist. But there's a huge difference. Um, I think many people would realize between saying Chinese food, which is a delicious cuisine, and the Chinese virus, which is something deadly, something that can kill you, something that's contagious. And it actually reminds, it can remind people that uh, by saying Chinese virus, it evokes images of us being like vermin, like, you know, rats or cockroaches carrying disease and pestilence. That's the same type of language that in the Rwandan genocide, led to the massacre of so many, you know, Tutsis. And, and when Robert Bugacera called them cockroaches. And so when we have that type of language coming from the president of the United States, calling the coronavirus a Chinese virus, it actually endangers a lot of Asian Americans. And I posted a tweet, um, actually, where I received the most hateful death threat from someone who emailed me. You know, I'm doing this telemedicine company uh, trying to help patients for free, you know, treat them for the coronavirus, screen them for the coronavirus, give them education. Um, and so my email is out there publicly. And so what happened was some white supremacist emailed me just the most horrifying, disgusting languages. Uh, he called my mother the C word. Uh, and he said, like, he wants to kill me. He, and he, he, doesn't, like, he said, as soon as we meet, I'm going to be in a grave and he's going to be uh, in jail because he's going to murder me. Uh, at the end, he says, like, I, he hates my ancestors and all these things. Like, it's just so indescribable hatred. And we also hear reports about Asian Americans getting beaten on the streets. Uh, some of them are getting stabbed, not just in America, but, you know, around the world. And so when the, the most powerful person in the world, the president of the United States, calls the coronavirus a Chinese virus, it endangers Asian people and Asian Americans everywhere. And it, it must be condemned. 866-801-8255. Eugene Gu is here. He's a doctor. Uh, I think when you were at Vanderbilt, your specialty was transplanting organs and babies. I, th I think I read so, that somewhere. Uh, so um, what happened was during medical school, I did a lot of research about trying to end the organ donor shortage. Um, and I tried to, in particular, I wanted to cure a disease called bilateral renal agenesis, where a baby is born without kidneys. So I was exploring ways to use microsurgery uh, to cure babies by transplanting fetal kidneys into babies while they're still in the womb so that they don't have to die uh, when they're born. Um, but uh, in terms of the specialty that I did at Vanderbilt, it was general surgery. And I was two and a half years into that when um, you know, I took the knee to fight white supremacy in solidarity with African-Americans and Colin Kaepernick. And when that picture of me uh, taking the knee went viral on social media, uh, you know, Vanderbilt really hated that. They didn't want to be associated <laughs> with any kind of, uh, you know, activism against racism. And they totally clamped down on me and ruined my career. But you know what? I, I'm not letting that stop me. You know, I have my own telemedicine company now. I was going to say, they didn't ruin your career. They didn't ruin your career. You're now doing work that you didn't even know that a pandemic was coming. You didn't even know no. that tele telemedicine would be so freaking important right now when you started Cool It. Um, and we're going to get into that in a second as well. But I want to know as a doctor, as a person that's on the front lines, and I, I look at this, people are co comparing it to war. You're on the front lines of something that is uh, going to take out, unfortunately, a lot of people. I don't care how many folks think it's not that serious. Every day I'm reading these stories of people who aren't here anymore, young people who aren't here anymore. What, what are we not getting about this coronavirus, this, this COVID-19? What are we not understanding? Why are people so taking it so lightly, in your opinion, Dr. Gu? Uh, that's a great, great question. Um, I think some people are taking it lightly. And, you know, some people really do take it seriously, so I don't want to disparage them. But a lot of young people in particular, and I think millennials, 
do take it less seriously. Um, and I think that's because they think that it's, quote, just the flu, in that if you're young and you're healthy and you don't have any kind of pre-existing medical conditions like diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol or, or heart problems, that you would just, you know, get the cold, get the flu, and then get over and you'll be fine. But what I think a lot of young people don't realize is that we live in a community. You know, like we're not just going to be seeing young people. We'll see, you know, our grandparents, sometimes, you know, our, our parents, people who are older, people who are vulnerable. And it's so incredibly selfish, I think, to think that, oh, I'm young and I'm invincible. I don't care if I get the virus. You don't care that, you know, your, your grandma might get the coronavirus and then she might actually die from this. Your, your, your parents might get the coronavirus and they might get really sick. Uh, you know, that is something that I think we, if you lose touch with who we are as part of a larger community, uh, you know, older individuals, people who have, you know, weak immune systems, they're part of us, too. They're part of the same family. And if we think that we can do whatever we want and don't care about those who are the most vulnerable, then you know, it's a disaster. All right. 866-801-8255. So I'm going to take a call. Someone in North Carolina wants to ask a question about vaping which I'm curious about too in coronavirus. We had a, a doctor on yesterday that said smoking and drinking totally compromises your immune system. You need to stop doing that. I'm, I can't imagine that vaping would be any different, but let me bring in Pamela in North Carolina. You're on with Dr. Eugene Gu. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I, this, I'm a first time caller um, as well. Yeah. And I've been listening long. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't been listening long because I, I just learned about this station when I got into this truck, uh, Sirius XM, in your station. So um, I did have my conspiracy theory about the kids dying last year from vaping. I believe that disease was around well before Wuhan had their uh, um, uh, people die first. And I believe it was over, you know, our kids, you know, the, not our kids, but the kids over here, the young adults that died of vaping last year, you know, with the severe complications mm. of pneumonia and so forth, with, with the major symptoms and everything that died with the vaping uh, because they were vapors. Um, they, mm. This disease had to come out well before then. Um, we, all, we learned about it when it came out in October, November um, last year. And I think those kids were, you know, some of the kids died around that time. And, uh, and since we received so many different things from China, I'm not sure if that's where it came from exactly. But my conspiracy theory is that it, it had to come from, you know, it had to be from something else other than okay. Wuhan. All right. Well, Pamela, thank you. Welcome to the family. First, I think the first time we heard about the coronavirus or COVID-19 was January uh, I think that's the first time we actually heard about it. But what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Gu? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And hi, Pamela. Um, so I heard that theory floating around social media as well, that the uh, vaping-associated lung injuries were actually an early manifestation of the coronavirus that wasn't recognized by the medical community. And I just want to, I mean, I understand how people can come up with these theories. I don't think it's anything from lack of intelligence or anything. It's just like people are scared and they want to have an explanation, and they want to explain what's going on in the world. So I totally understand that. But just as a physician who understands and, you know, did a lot of research into the vaping epidemic, um, let me just explain why I don't believe that that has anything to do with the coronavirus. And the reason why I say that is because when uh, we examined the vaping-associated lung injuries, we saw that uh, when you take up fluid from the lung, doing a procedure called a bronchio, bronchioalveolar lavage, or BAL. That's where you take a, a camera uh, and you put a little bit of saline fluid into the lungs, you wash it back, and you, you examine the fluid that comes back. What we saw there were some immune cells called macrophages that were having filled with oil. So like, the, basically what happened is these black market vapes, uh, which were not authorized, not made by reputable companies, but by people in their garages, there was like a company called Dank Vapes that allowed people to build their own black market vapes, you know, putting who knows what into the vapes, vegetable oil or vitamin E acetate or all kinds of contaminants into these vaping cartridges. What happened is people were inhaling oil and this mm -hmm. oil, this vitamin E oil or vegetable oil or all kinds of 
nasty stuff went into the lungs. And we've seen throughout history uh, that when uh, patients ingest oil, uh, especially elderly patients who take an oil-based laxative and, they, you know, they vomit and some of that vomit goes into their lungs, they suffered almost the identical kind of severe lung injury that uh, these young people who are vaping were subjected to. And so I know, like, we, we get the similar images of young people on ventilators, uh, you know, really, really sick, and many of them dying, and it reminds us of the coronavirus, but they're completely different. When, when it comes to the coronavirus, we have, you know, tests that show that they are infected with an actual viral agent, and it's not like they have oil in their lungs. Right. Uh, so I understand where Pamela's coming from, uh, but I just wanted to spell that rumor uh, because it's not based on actual scientific evidence. And this uh, is what we do like, here. I totally yep. understand. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you, um, because this is Tech Tuesday, and I hope you can stick around because I want to ask you about Cool It and uh, how this happened. And Tina on Twitter wants to know, were you able to become a licensed doctor after losing your residency? And were you able to pick up a residency somewhere else? Right. That's, great a, uh, that's a great question. So I was not able to pick up a residency somewhere else. Still searching for that. I think we talked about that last time when I was yeah. on the show. Uh, but I have my hands full with a telemedicine company. And what we do is we have very many licensed physicians, nurse practitioners, other medical professionals, a lot of them from Stanford, who are helping me see patients. Um, and my job as a CEO of Cool Quit, uh, which is originally a smoking cessation company, uh, was is to manage all of these physicians who are working for me, reporting to me about these patients. So in a way, like, I don't even have time to see patients myself because running this telemedicine company in both in Texas, California, Florida, soon we're going to expand to South Carolina, uh, Illinois, New York. Um, it's a full-time job, and I, like, barely have time to keep up with it. But I am okay. also applying for a medical license uh, in New York and Arizona. The thing is, the requirement for a medical license is that you graduate from uh, accredited medical school. I went to Duke University School of Medicine. Uh, that you have at least <laughs> yes. one year of training, and I have two and a half years of training uh, for residency, uh, and that you pass all your USMLE uh, board exams. And I've passed step one, step two, and step three. So I'm fully qualified to have medical licenses in almost all the states in, in the United States. It's, it's a simple matter of applying for it through each state medical board uh, and that's that's a process that i'm in the middle of right now uh, but i also have my hands full managing a lot of you know doctors nurse practitioners and seeing all these patients with the coronavirus and i actually advise doctors on how to treat these patients you know they ask me for advice because this is a new emerging disease um, and you, it takes a lot of research into the literature into what's going on um, in order to treat these patients well, I hope you can stay around for another segment to talk about Cool Quit, coolquit.com. And I also want to ask you questions about the lungs and how vulnerable our lungs are and how we can improve our lung health. Because, you know, from vaping to coronavirus, that seems to be the point of entry. And I want to shore that up for us and at least try to come up with some ways that we can prevent things from happening. Well, don't vape. That's one thing. But as far mm -hmm. as viruses are concerned, how can we keep our lung health uh, at its optimum day. Let me welcome back Dr. Eugene Gu. Thanks for sticking around. So, no so tell me, Dr. Before we went to break, um, we were talking about this telemedicine and cool quit, right? Is it cool quit? Yeah, it's cool quit. Uh, it's like um, the motto is it's cool to quit smoking. And that's why we first started off as a smoking cessation telemedicine company uh, before this coronavirus pandemic started. And so the reason why you were able to pivot is because smoking impacts the lungs. So exactly, exactly right. And so the, the notion now is telemedicine and getting people information and getting people help. You guys are also facilitating testing. How are you doing that virtually? Yeah, gr uh, great question, Karen. So what we do is we have a screening coronavirus questionnaire. Um, and it asks a series of questions about uh, a patient's symptoms. For instance, we know uh, that based on what the WHO has told us and the CDC, that uh, the three main symptoms of the coronavirus for most patients um, is going to be fever, shortness of breath, and a dry cough. And that's what a lot of patients come, uh, kind of present with. There's some other unusual symptoms as well, like uh, some patients lose their lack of smell. Some patients have some gastrointestinal, like diarrhea complaints. Uh, a lot of patients have 
uh, like basic general fatigue. But in general, there's the, these three main complaints that we kind of look out for. But we have a whole litany of questions asking patients about any kind of flu-like symptoms that they have. Um, and then we have a, a little box after that so they can fill in the blank and kind of explain in their own words what their symptoms are. Um, and then we have a physician go through every patient's submission and make sure, and we can triage it. Do we, do we think this patient needs to be seen uh, and because we have a high suspicion of coronavirus, or do we think this patient just has like the common cold or something that's completely, uh, you know, not too related to the coronavirus whatsoever? Um, and so, and after uh, the physician determines, okay, we need to see this patient, we schedule the patient for an appointment uh, to meet with one of our providers. Um, and this meeting is done through telemedicine, meaning it's a face-to-face -face video interaction. Uh, the patient can d connect directly with the doctor um, using you know, either their phone, the FaceTime, or the com desktop computer, or the web, web camera. Uh, but we can see the patient face-to-face -face and kind of see how the patient is doing, like the general appearance, are there any, any kind of acute distress? Um, and then I think, I believe you asked me, how do we get these patients tested? So there's two ways that we do this. One is we rewrite a detailed medical authorization uh, after this uh, face-to-face interview to determine uh, if the patient can get tested at a drive-through testing center near them, or sometimes it's going to be an academic medical center. We send a lot of patients uh, in California to Stanford Hospital, which has developed their own in-house coronavirus test that's uh, approved by the FDA and the CDC, but not dependent upon the CDC to, to, you know, to create that test. Um, and then the second thing we're working on is we're in talks with several companies and laboratories to produce home coronavirus testing kits. Mm -hmm. We're really excited about this uh, because once that has FDA approval, uh, because we don't send anything to patients that are not FDA approved, because that's not ethical, that's not responsible. So once these home testing kits get FDA approval, uh, we are going to ship them for free to patients and to make sure that they can actually get tested at home. And the problem with the one issue with home coronavirus testing kits uh, that may be out there in the media is that there's a high false negative rate. Yep, that, I'm hearing that. Uh, because, right, because when the patients are testing things on their own, they may not be as educated about you know what to do. They might just they might lick it. They might put it just in their nostril. But we need to go deep down into their throat to get the coronavirus. And so what we do is when we ship these home coronavirus testing kits to the patients, uh, they're going to have this face-to-face, -face, uh, real-time video interaction with the doctor. And so that doctor is going to mm. instruct them step by step on how to administer this test. And the doctor can tell, okay, well, you know, you're not doing this right. We need to, we need to swab it again. We need to swab it like this. Uh, and then the false negative rate is going to drop dramatically because it's literally kind of like administered by an actual doctor. Uh, it's just through telemedicine. Uh, and so I think that's the added value of using modern technology uh, to kind of protect both the doctor and the patient because you, you're not requiring the patient to go into the clinic where they can infect other patients, where they can get infected, uh, just for getting the test where they can infect the doctor, where we're wasting all of these supplies, this personal protective equipment, uh, just like having the doctor or healthcare professional test the patient on site. Instead, we're using telemedicine to have the patient test themselves with direct guidance from an educated doctor who can see what's going on. Mm, this is so there's so much misinformation out there, Dr. Gu. And I and I'm I, Drew and I were talking before you got on about the anxiety around everybody. Like I st stayed up last night thinking I had every single coronavirus symptom. And so I'm like, what do I do? And, it, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of, you know, some of it's psychosomatic, some of it's real. I mean, some of us could be having colds. We could be having other kind of infections. Everything right now is at a heightened uh, awareness. How, how do you triage this? How do you really, you know, if I, if I come to you with a dry cough and some shortness of the breath, shortness of breath, but no fever, because a lot of people don't have a fever. How do you determine who should be tested and who shouldn't, or what's the next step? That's a great question, Karen. And I think a lot of that is going to be dependent on the provider uh, offering the telemedicine face-to-face -face with the video. When you talk to the patient, you can get a lot, you know, as a physician, you get a lot of information 
just hearing the patient speak, the tenor of their voice, their body language, you know, how they look on the video, uh, and, and, and the story that they tell about their symptoms. So sometimes just by, you know, talking to the patient at, at length, you can kind of differentiate shortness of breath or, or palpitations or something like mm. that that's due to anxiety versus something that's due to an infectious agent like the coronavirus. It's not 100%, but still like doing an actual interview rather than just reading questions that a patient submits uh, right. is a lot more accurate uh, in diagnosis. And it's as close as we can get to actually interviewing a patient okay. in the room, which is actually more dangerous. Right, for you and for them. Uh, because a, exactly. a lot of medical professionals do not even have the proper masks, the proper, you know, gloves, and they're out there literally not just being afraid of being infected, but also p possibly carrying 866-801-8255. Okay, so people listening right now all over the country, where do they go if they feel like they have some of these symptoms? Do they go to cool quit? And then what do they do when they get to cool quit, like quit smoking, cool, like it's cool outside, quit Dot com. What, what do you, walk us through it. Yeah, uh, great question, Karen. So um, right now we are operating in California, Texas, and Florida. Uh, we, we plan to go to as many states as possible, uh, but right now those are where our licensed physicians and nurse practitioners um, are located, and we can't operate in states where we don't have a license. So for any right. of your listeners who are in California, uh, Texas, Florida, you know, we, we want to expand to New York, New Jersey, all the n Northeast, but right now those are the states we're in. What would happen is at the top of our page, when you go to coolquit.com, uh, you will see a coronavirus screening uh, questionnaire. So you click on that button and you'll get, go through a series of questions that will ask you for all of your symptoms, uh, you know, ranging from your respiratory symptoms, like a cough, shortness of breath, whether you have a fever, and just a history of all your symptoms. Um, and then at the end of that, you submit it, and one of our physicians will actually take a look at all your answers um, and then det determine if you are, have a high likelihood of a coronavirus enough that we're suspicious for it and that we want to schedule you for an appointment. Then we will give you a link that will let you schedule an appointment with one of our doctors and nurse practitioners, and then you can you know, talk face-to-face with an actual doctor about your symptoms. And then that doctor can either write you prescriptions, you know, for cough medications, or if, you, if they think you have the flu, we can give you Tamiflu prescriptions, uh, antibiotics if you think that you have a sinus infection. Uh, so there's a whole lot of things we can actually do treatment-wise through telemedicine. And if we really, after that interview, really think that, okay, man, you're having a fever, you're having this dry cough, you're having uh, the shortness of breath, you're looking pretty ill uh, on the telemedicine visit, I think maybe we need to get you tested. At that point, uh, we will then direct you to your local drive through or academic medical center t uh, place where you can get a coronavirus testing kit. We'll write a medical authorization to make sure that your test is covered you know, either by your insurance company or by the CDC because the law was passed saying that you know, all these tests should be free to the patient. And we want to make sure we're your advocates as well. We want to make sure that you aren't charged for anything. You aren't charged by us. We never do any kind of surprise medical billing. We never bill you for anything. We don't collect your credit card or any payment information. And when we send you to someone else, we want to make sure that you also don't get billed by that entity. Um, and then, you know, then you get tested. Uh, if your test comes back positive, we report that to the CDC. There's a CDC person of interest form. Uh, and then we report that. We don't, you know, report your information that, that's right. not, like, legally required by law. But this is this is one of those, like, legal requirements for the coronavirus. Um, and then we, we guide you on quarantining yourself at home, making sure you don't get your family members sick. Uh, and that's kind of like the the whole process there. And we're, we're looking for doctors to expand in different states. So if your viewers are any physicians, you know, listening uh, to this show, and if you're a licensed provider uh, in any of the states outside of, or even within California, Texas, and Florida, uh, we're interested in, in recruiting you to help us help patients. I love that. I love that. Okay, so before we went to break, I asked you about the lungs and ways in which we can keep our lungs healthy or uh, protect our lungs because that is the point of entry for this virus. It's, it decimates the lungs. Um, do you have any advice on that, Dr. Gu? 
Yeah, the unfortunately the lung damage um, is can in some cases be pretty severe. Most the majority of cases, I think upwards of eighty uh, percent, especially if you're a young person, you can recover. Um, but what happens with this virus and the lung damage that you mentioned is sometimes our immune system, when it's geared up to fight this invader that's never seen before, you know, it we need our immune system to kill the virus. But sometimes it can go overboard, and when the immune system goes overboard, it doesn't only kill our infected lung cells that have the coronavirus, but it starts to kill healthy tissue too. And when that happens, it becomes this cascade of damage uh, that can lead to some a dreaded complication that we call uh, ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. That's where there's so much lung damage and inflammation uh, because your immune system starts to just attack healthy lung tissue that you accumulate fluid in your lungs, you can't breathe, you're literally drowning in your own fluid. And at that point, your only chance of survival um, is to get intubated, to go into the ICU, and to be hooked up to a ventilator. And that's why we hear all this discussion in the news, uh, even like Elon Musk is chiming in saying that, you know, we yeah. need to have more ventilators. And, well, he's actually donating. Uh, he's getting um, he's in, what well, he's getting these from China and making them available for free here in America. So he's actually getting their leftover ventilators and bringing them here. He said, yep, wow. I had an o he said China had an oversupply of ventilators. And my question is, why does China have an oversupply and we don't, we're not prepared at all? But I'm just gonna throw that out there. China had an oversupply, this is what Elon Musk uh, tweeted. He said, so we bought FDA approved ResMed, Philips and Medtronic ventilators on Friday night and air shipped them to LA. And if you want a free ventilator install please let us know so yeah people are stepping up but we should have an oversupply it's crazy right right and right. i think the reason why we don't have an oversupply is because america transitioned its economy from a manufacturing economy that china currently has as a manufacturing you know powerhouse into a service-based economy where we lost all the knowledge and know-how for manufacturing um, and we just do you know more service related industries and so I think, you know, in terms of this pandemic as a wake up call, we need to have the manufacturing capacity to do, you know, advanced medical products like ventilators, mm. um, like, because like we can't just depend on other countries for manufacturing uh, when our people's health and safety is at risk. And especially if we want to have trade wars with the very countries that we need to uh, right. get things from. But uh, the question I'd ask you about the lung health was preventive, not what it does, because I've spent a lot of time online uh, mm -hmm. reading about what it does. So I knew that. But how do we keep our lungs healthy before we get a virus? Ah, great question. And I think the best way to keep our lungs healthy, well, first of all, is to not damage our lungs. So there's a lot of smokers out there. You know, we found it cool quit to stop smoking <laughs> precisely for reasons like this. You know, it damages your lungs it, and it makes you very, it damages your immune system too. So it makes you very susceptible to the coronavirus. Uh, but even, even vaping, vaping is 95% less harmful than smoking, but it's still harmful. It still damages your lung um, and it makes you vulnerable to, to the coronavirus. So, you know, if you are a smoker, if you are a vapor, you know, come to Cool Quit and we'll help you quit that too. You don't have to have the coronavirus to use our free telemedicine services will also help you quit your tobacco addiction. Um, in addition to not, you know, putting harmful things into your lungs, there are things that we can do uh, to keep our lungs healthy as well. And that in particular exercise, cardiovascular exercise. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of us are stuck at home and people, some of your listeners will be thinking, how can I exercise when I can't even leave my house and I'm on lockdown? Well, there's a lot of aerobic exercises that you can actually do in your own home to stay healthy. Um, and that includes like doing jumping jacks. You can get a jump rope. Uh, if you don't have one, you can probably order one online. Um, you can do push-ups, you can do sit-ups. There's a lot, there's a lot of, um, in YouTube, there's a lot of home exercises that you can do that gets your heart pumping and gets you breathing faster. Uh, and we know from you know many, many studies that doing a lot of exercises can increase your lung capacity. And if you think about this, if you get the coronavirus and you get that dreaded complication, the ARDS that I talked about, it's all about how much lung capacity you have to spare. So mm. the, the more you exercise, the more you do the deep breathing and get your heart pumping and stay as healthy as you can during this time. If you, you know, God forbid, get the coronavirus, you have a lot more lung to spare in case something goes wrong.
Oh, so being an avid swimmer, because it's the one thing that you can com totally increase your lung capacity. Not that we could do that now because many swimming pools are closed, but being an avid swimmer, which I am, has probably helped increase my lung capacity because that, that even helps people who are runners. If you swim, you know, um, and, and you, you swim, you swim rigorous, rigorously. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, that's some great information. Would you stay in touch with us, Dr. Gu? I, I, I love the work that you do. More importantly, I love your heart and how you care about people. You put people first. And uh, I, I don't know how Cool Quit is able to do this as a business without taking any money. Um, so I do want to get in your business a little bit because it's Tech Tuesday. How do you get paid doing this this company without taking money from people? Oh, that's a great question. And um, we are running into some issues now. We, we First of all, we don't charge patients a dime. Every patient that we have treated has been treated completely free of charge to the patient. Uh, the way that we're trying to stay afloat is that some of our patients have insurance. Uh, but the, as you know, the insurance companies are not like, they don't really want to pay and reimburse doctors if they can help it. And so what we're running into is that there are things called HMO plans and out-of-network uh, plans where if you are not within that insurance company's network, uh, like a lot of Medicare Advantage plans, a lot of Blue, Car Blue Cross, Blue Shield, HMO plans, they don't let you bill if you're not within their network. Uh, and so we're running into a lot of issues with that. We were hoping to stay financially solvent and afloat and continue to help patients and expand uh, by getting reimbursed by the insurance companies when the patients have insurance. Um, but that's proving to be a very difficult challenge. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're trying to do everything we can to stay afloat. The, we've been able to see patients so far using our savings. So we've been, you know, blowing through our savings because this is an emergency and we wanted to do something to help. Uh, but there's going to come in time, come a point in time where we're not going to be able to keep on seeing patients if the insurance companies are going to be, you know, evil about not reimbursing right. us for, for helping patients. So that's a fight that I'm trying to wage on social media to get the insurance companies to do the right thing, to get state and federal governments to waive out-of-network requirements for telemedicine. Uh, because what we have now is that there's a few telemedicine companies who are basically monopolies. Uh, they have these shady deals with insurance companies, like with Blue Cross, Blue Shield, uh, where, they, where the insurance company only lets you see that telemedicine provider. The problem is a lot of patients don't have choice uh, they don't. They may not like that telemedicine provider, and they may not. Uh, they may have a long waiting time. And some telemedicine companies that have these exclusive deals with insurance companies, they don't even offer video face-to-face -face mm. telemedicine. They just have some nurse or some doctor, t uh, you know, call you over the phone, and they're not really as interested in, as, and as passionate about patient care or knowledgeable as we are, because this is what we do. We specialize in respiratory issues, um, and we care about our patients. And so I think that there's this. So much corruption in the healthcare industry, so much inequalities, uh, and this pandemic is kind of, you know, highlighting all of those issues and bringing them all to the fore because we have a broken healthcare system in this country. And and I think we have an opportunity. This should wake up a whole lot of people to do something about it, to put pressure on those on those companies, on those insurance companies who are definitely standing in the way of us getting the kinds of, of care that we, we deserve. And I'm grateful for people like you who are using your platforms to put pressure, but we, the people who are actually, at, you know, at the mercy of these uh, companies now can exact some pa power. I think this is time for us to take back our power. So there we are. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I completely agree with that sentiment. You know, a lot of we, the American people, are at the mercy of these huge insurance companies, these huge monopolies, uh, and they want to, like their whole business model is making sure that you get the le least amount of care possible because that costs them money. They're, they're happy to take your insurance premiums, they're happy to take your money, but when it comes time to a pandemic and it's time as an insurance company to pay up, you know, they don't want to pay up. So they're using this as an opportunity to raise premiums while trying to, saying that, oh, our costs are gone up because of the coronavirus, but then they don't want to give you care. They want to restrict your care as much as possible. And that's why we need not just the insurance companies to step up because they're not going to voluntarily do this on their own. We need state governments and federal governments to lay down the rule of law and say, you know, 
you got to stop all these restrictions and all these convoluted laws that are stopping patients from getting care with telemedicine. Hey, Doc, um, Dr. Gu, I, I've got a question. I, I keep thinking about... The... Who are you? Who is this talking? Oh, this, <laughs> this is Andrew McCaskill, uh, okay. Dr. Gu. I, I, I've been on with Karen and listening, and I spent four months of the last 12 months uninsured um and me along with about 27 million people in the u.s right not counting all the folks who are eligible for medicaid etc um what about people who are uninsured right now i mean a lot of a lot of people have that question around trying to figure out the balance between am i sick enough to go get help yet what are you know what what do you say to folks who who have people in their in their circle or their sphere of influence who are uninsured that being uninsured now becomes part of the math that they have to do to figure out how to take care of themselves in the middle of a pandemic mm, great, great question, question. Um, yeah so uh, for there are, I, I believe and um, we need to double check the statistics. I believe there are around 30 million Americans who are uninsured in this country. And that's a lot of Americans who have no health insurance. Um, and it's a travesty that we live in a country where we have no single payer universal health care where they can get insured. Um, and in terms of your question of what do you do if you're an uninsured patient, you're in the middle of this pandemic, you have no health insurance, what are your options? Well, first of all, I want everyone to know if you're uninsured, there's a federal law called EMTALA. It's an emergency care act where if, no matter what, no emergency room can deny you care in a life-threatening emergency. So if you have the severe shortness of breath, you think, oh, my God, I have the coronavirus. I'm, I don't know what to do. I, my, I feel like my life is threatened and I might die if I don't get uh, medical care. You can go to any emergency department. They have to treat you. They cannot turn you away because they're required by federal law to give emergency life-saving care to anybody who seeks it, whether you're homeless, whether you're uninsured, anybody. So there's that. But, um, you know, what if you're not at death's door? What if you're, you're really sick, you want to get, you know, some kind of advice from a doctor, um, but you don't have health insurance? Uh, that's, that's the really tricky part because there's no federal guarantee for preventative or non-life-threatening medical care for the uninsured. You know, I heard stories about how the CDC during a time of national emergency, which we are in, is supposed to cover, you know, the treatment and screening and everything for the coronavirus. But as you know, the Trump administration is not executing on that. I have seen nowhere where, you know, doctors ha can submit reimbursement claims for uninsured patients to the CDC. Uh, so that's kind of like this pipe dream. You know, here at Cool Quit, we do see uninsured patients uh, as much as we can. Uh, the thing is, like, we blow through our own savings, seeing as many patients as we can. Um, and if we get so many uninsured patients, at, at a certain point, we're, we're not going to be able to see patients at all because we'll go down under. And so that's the, I think that's also the story for a lot of doctors out there. Many doctors, they see uninsured patients pro bono. But the more time and resources and everything that we spend seeing uninsured patients without any kind of federal government help or assistance or any kind of bailout whatsoever, you know, these these gigantic corporations that are getting bailouts, but doctors are not, you know, then we, we end up ourselves going bankrupt. And I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a real issue that we have in our country. Uninsured patients need care. Uh, and like, why are, do we live in a country where they don't get any kind of, you know, health insurance? You are, you're raising. So, I mean, listen, this election is going to be pivotal. November is going to be, pivotal and it's not about who you like and whether or not this person looks strong or presidential it's about what can get done for you after you elect this person and we need to put health care for all on the table i don't care what it looks like whether we're talking about medicaid for medicare for all universal um whatever expanding obamacare i think that this is the pivotal election that will make or break america so uh it's time we got all hands on deck. I'm grateful, Dr. Gu, that you're among those hands that are actually working towards good. And uh, I thank you for being a part of our family, too. Thanks for being here today. Well, thank you so much, Karen. All right. Dr. Gu, follow him. Eugene Gu and go to coolquit.com.